Hello, hello. Is my audio working? Hello, Philip. This is Yanis. Hello, Yanis. Yes, Philip. Uh, are you presenting Piraeus? Yes. Is it from the famous Greek port, or uh, I want to ask on the other presentation? <laughs> is it the Greek port or not? Yeah, we we. It 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 is named after the port in Greece. Yes. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I was sure. I was sure. So yeah. I didn't want to jump on the other meeting, but I was pretty sure that it was uh, Piraeus. Yeah. My team is from Piraeus. My favorite. Oh wow. <laughs> I'm Greek. I'm Greek. So yeah. My parents yeah. are actually from from Piraeus. So from Piraeus. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was the only once in my life. <laughs> Ah, it's very. How did you uh, did you do the naming or? Um, yeah, you know, we were looking for something with with Kubernetes context and you know ships and containers, etc. Nice, nice. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay makes how sense. you come up with with periods. Nice, nice. And I think it it also has a very long history, right? So it was all already in the antique time. Uh, it's pretty ancient, the port, yep. yes. Uh, yep. So yeah, 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 it has a history, yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah. Good morning or good afternoon. Good afternoon, Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi, Philippe. Thank you for joining. We'll we'll wait for a few more people to um to join the call and then we can start. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, we're just waiting for a couple more people uh, to join the call and then we'll start shortly.
Okay. Um, it's coming up to five minutes, so I think we can we should start. Um, today we have uh, two key things on the agenda. We have two um, uh, project presentations. Um, the follow up presentation of the Piraeus data store project um, and a presentation from Yanis on the data set lifecycle framework. Um, so, Philippe, do you want to go first? Yes, of course. Okay, um, then let me share my screen. Um, okay. So, um, today I will try to outline what is really the, the scope of the Perios data store project. Um, and in, in very few words, it is an operator, a CSI driver, and at a later point in time, it will be this failover controller. So this is what the rest of the of the slides is about and just to re remind you about the context all this Piraeus stuff is about getting the Linstore storage system connected to Kubernetes um, and Linstore itself um, relies for storage replication on a component called DVD which is a kernel part but let's focus on this area so the first thing, the operator, the Perios Kubernetes operator um, is in charge of installing all the components and also configuring them. And for every Linster cluster, there is a Linster controller needed. So that that is just one container running in a deployment and yeah it gets installed and configured by the operator then there's a satellite uh, that needs to run on all the nodes of the cluster also installed and configured by the operator then the dbd kernel module that can be brought in by the Perius operator but it is in a way optional, um, no configuration needed. Then there is an etcd instance necessary. Well, um, let me put it that way. The Linster controller can use an etcd instance and makes a, that makes a lot of sense because then all your metadata is stored within the Kubernetes cluster. So I would say this is the recommended way if you insist to use an external SQL database, that is possible as well. Then the, the storage devices, well, you have to install them. <laughs> they need to be there. Um, and if you wish, uh, the operator will discover any not used block devices and add them to the Linster system as available storage pools. Yeah, the, the CSI driver is installed, of course. The snapshot controller um, is optionally installed and also the stock scheduler. And that's, a, that's the stock scheduler with the um, patches for Linstore. And by the way, I just learned that the the modifications to the stock scheduler are now, um, uh, th there is a merge request out for, uh, for a stock upstream. Okay, so that's that's the operator and... Hey, quick question. Yeah. Um, the, the operator itself, um, is, is, is that um, using 
one of the operator frameworks or SDKs? Um, I think so. Is there Moritz on the call? Yeah, I'm on the call. And yes, it's using the operator SDK from, yeah. Cool. Um, and then how does, how does a, um, an operator install kernel modules? So this is this is basically just a kind of an optional step in the or one of uh, you can basically configure the init containers for the satellites. So the satellites are a daemon set, and optionally you there's init containers which uh, can pull in the kernel modules and depending on um, how you configure that, it's either kernel modules that are already available on your system or one that are brought in from our side. So pre-compiled, but this is only supported for a limited set of distributions. Oh, I see. So, so the, the, the previous operator pulls down um, pre-compiled kernel modules. Are, are those in a repo somewhere or, or how does that work? Um, let, let me jump in here. Um, so the, the Piraeus operator has the option to also compile the kernel module on your box. So um, that only works if the, if the worker nodes have the kernel headers uh, locally and then it compiles it within that init container and then it uh, loads it into the kernel from the init container that must run in privileged mode. And, I, I, okay. And, and the, with, with the pre-compiled, um, that works for defined distributions. So for, let's say, you know, the rel kernel, etc. And then it comes with all these RPMs packaged into it. Okay, understood. And just just one other question, not completely related to to Perius, but um, I see that you are um, installing and managing um, etcd. Is that is that based on one of the current um, etcd operators or is is that your own um, is, is that your own implementation of, of an etcd operator and no that's um, basically just a dependency on one of the already existing um, operators we looked around a bit and uh, used the one that fit our use case it's, it's basically kind of the how should i say um to have the complete package. So you only need basically the Piraeus operator to get started. Um, that's why we included this etcd. Um, probably you want to later in a big installation, you have that one deployed yourself using already an operator somewhere. So you can reuse that. Got it, got it. Okay, understood. That's helpful, thank you. Okay, thanks. thanks for the questions, then let's move on. Yeah, so here we have a bit more description about the kernel modules. So as, as mentioned, in many cases, um, you want to get this DVD module loaded because that gives you storage replication. Um, in some cases, it it just ensures that the NVMe or Fabrix drivers are loaded um, if you choose that your storage architecture is based on that. Yeah, I, I think then the Linster configuration data, I think we already, I already touched that. So either the, the etcd within the cluster or an external etcd or an external SQL database 
And I think in that area, we support uh, Postgres databases and MariaDB. And yeah, snapshot controller might be provided with your Kubernetes distribution and Stork. We already touched on that. And yeah, Stork is very helpful if your lint store is going to use DVD because then it can hint to Kubernetes where to place um, pause that require persistent volumes in an optimized way. Right. Right. Then uh, the CSI driver is also part of the Piraeus data store project. And currently it has these capabilities. So provisioning, attaching, snapshotting, resizing, it is read write once. Um, file IO mode, well, so the, the storage stack, so DVD does block devices, so it by default it gives you an XFS file system on top, but if you wish you can have another file system, an ext4, uh, if you wish you can modify the mount flags or the MKFS flags, etc. Um, and it can also give you uh, persistent volumes in block IO mode. And that's especially interesting with KubeVirt, of course. And although our stuff is read write once, we allow um, access from two nodes for a very special case for the live migration because during live migration, KVM um, has the block device open on the source node and already opens it on the target node before it closes it on the source node. So for that use case, we, we have like special case that so that we can support live migration of VMs under KubeVirt. Yeah. Interesting. Does does that um, does that sort of maintain um, uh, I/O consistency? Is there some sort of um, I/O ordering that's that's maintained beyond between sort of the local and the remote? Um, it, is that a generic question or to a? To the life regarded to the life migration. Oh, uh, which regards to the, to the life migration. Sort of, if if a mm -hmm. if a read write once block device is being accessed in two places at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. How 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 do you make sure that um, you 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 don't have sort of out yeah. of order um, I/O hitting the back end? Yeah. Well, in 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 case of 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 the life migration and KVM, it is that. KVM just opens it on the target node, but doesn't access it. Then it stops accessing it on the source node, still has it open. Then it migrates all the, the memory pages. And then at some point it, it closes it on the um, source node. So it, it KVM actually doesn't access the block device in parallel from both nodes concurrently. So that makes it easy for us. Um, but the, gotcha. the, the mechanism behind it is called the dual primary mode in DBD. And there we have a full paper on that, how that works. And it deals with these uh, uh, um, parallel accesses to the same block. Um, so the, the problem is concurrent write accesses to the same block or the same LBA happening on two nodes. And yeah, there's a full paper on it and lots of details, um, but nothing we want to introduce in modern workloads. Excellent, thank you. Okay, then I'm moving on here to my to my roadmap slide. So I, I 
think I already had it on the first slide that we plan to do this HA controller for rapid failover of stateful sets on, and the persistent volumes. Um, that is still in planning stage. Um, we need to do some foundation work on the DVD side. Uh, we need to do some plumbing work on the Linster side. And then the, the final thing as the HA controller. So I expect that we will be there on let's say maybe September, October timeframe. Um, then there is a GUI in the works. It is called LinView. Um, um, that is done by a group outside of Linbit. And we need to look into that and probably will integrate deployment of that LinView GUI into the operator. Hmm. Um, so, so just to clarify, the, the, the project you're proposing to put into Sandbox is the, is the Perius operator, right? Um, Yes, it's the operator and the CSI driver and the future AHA controller, which doesn't exist as of today. Gotcha, thank you. Um, I, I have that here on this slide. So the operator, the CSI driver, the HA control. Um, if the LinView GUI can also be part of that, um, I need to bring in that group. I don't, I cannot answer that from top of my head right now. And then the, the third item I have here in the roadmap is this uh, read, write many leveraging Linux kernel and uh, NFS server and client. That is like a, you know, a far out goal. So maybe some something we will work on in 2020. Maybe it happens never, I don't know. Yeah, so that is what we plan here for the future. Then what what is the current community? How did all that come together? Um, and it literally came together with uh, uh, Linbit and Dow Cloud uh, um, talking about the idea to to bring Linstore closer to Kubernetes. And what we created in the process so far is we, we have this, this landing page. Well, we have the, the operator, the CSI driver, uh, which is all on, on GitHub. Um, there's a the Slack channel where we interact with, with the users of the stack, Twitter account. So that, that that is all part of what we would uh, uh, want to give to the CNCF, either sandbox or, or even further. Yeah, and Right, that, that also touches on how all that should go into these foundations around there. So uh, a version of DBD is already on the Linux kernel, but we need to upgrade that. So this is already ongoing since many years. Um, we are right now talking about getting Perios into the CNCF and then there are first talks of getting Linstore into the Soda Foundation. Um, but we are, here we are in the progress of learning the details. Let me, let me put it that way. Okay, that, that, yes. that, sounds, that sounds really good. Um, so, so Philippe, um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we've um, the CNCF has recently changed the the sandbox um, application process. So, um, uh, if you want to proceed with this, there is a, a relatively simple online form you can you can fill in to to provide um, details, and the the TOC 
um, uh, votes on that. Um, I don't know if it's monthly or bi-monthly. They vote on that to um, to uh, to approve those those sandbox projects. Um, so so I guess that was that should be your your next step now. Okay. And I I will find that with Google in a few clicks, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Amy, did I did I represent that correctly? Ah, oh, maybe she's not there. Um, yeah, but I'll I, I can send you I can send you a link as well um, in an email. It's but it should be it should be on the main website of the CNCF too. Okay, perfect. So yes, okay, then we will take that next step. I, my, my idea was I, I tried to speak with the uh, storage SIG first to, to understand if there is any, anything more, but yeah, then I go to the form as the next step. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have um, any other questions for, for Philippe before we move on to the next presentation? Hi, Alex. Uh, oh, uh, this is Amy. Just stepping back in. Um, I, I uh, yeah. stepped away. I believe I answered the question in chat as far as like where the form is. But yes. happy to be able to take this offline. Okay. Y yes, thank you. I found the link. Lovely. Excellent. Okay, carry on. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I think we hear you. Oh, okay. This is Alex Jim from Docloud. I just want to mention that uh, we just get informed that we are our top the topic about careers just got picked up by the uh, KubeCon China, which is uh, we hold virtually online on July 31, 31st, sorry, 31st. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, I put a, a question there, something to think about is we also have Rook and Rook is a orchestrator of storage systems. So I'm wondering if uh, this kind of, you know, we could think about uh, this an extension of, maybe they can think about maybe how Rook would benefit them or, or not. Uh, you know, it's just an, another idea. Yeah, our, our, our impression here is that, that Rook is so strongly associated with Ceph um, that our feeling was it would be better something independent of, of Rook. Sure, yeah, I understand. So, so incidentally, I think that was the case in the early days of Rook, but uh, that's no longer the case. And they have um, support for several other storage uh, backends, as far as I understand. Uh, so you might want to have a have another look at that if if it's still interesting to you. Okay. Yeah, it really depends on the storage system, yeah, um, but you should look at it. Take a look at it if it helps. If not, then we'll just take you know no doesn't damage or hurt you in any way, just curious. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right, if, if there are no more questions, we can move on to the, to the next um, presentation. So, um, uh, Yanis, are, are you on the call? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so, so the floor is yours um, yeah. to present the data set lifecycle framework. Okay, very good. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so let me start. Thanks, Philip, for the presentation. And so the desktop. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically we are, uh, just to briefly introduce, we are a small team of committers from IBM Research Europe. Um, and um, this is, uh, uh, sorry, let me, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to move the, uh, 
anyway, so yeah, I don't know how to move the zoom. Okay, so we are trying to make it somewhat um, easier for the data scientists and the data engineers to have access to remote data sources. Uh, currently, we have implemented uh, connectors to S3 and NFS, but we're expanding. And um, from the side of the data provider, uh, we're looking to bring a, um, let's say, easier way to expose data sets and provide access to their uh, to their end users, right? Uh, also, another bit that we are looking at is how to enforce, uh, how to make sure uh, they have uh, governed uh, access to these uh, to these uh, remote data sources. Um, so now on the more technical uh, objectives that we have, right? We are introducing the um, concept of uh, data set, right? So we it's a new custom resource definition, of course, that is actually a pointer to remote uh, S3 or NFS uh, data sources. We have also added the ability to look up uh, data sets from remote catalogs like uh, Hive Metastore. And at the same time, we are looking to, minim to, have, to introduce minimal changes to the end user workload. So, as the uh, the users would be shouldn't be shouldn't modify their workflows in order to leverage uh, the data sets. Um, and now the bit that we just uh, finished is the transparent data caching that I will give some details in, uh, in the next slide. So basically, uh, we want we want to bring uh, a pluggable interface for caching frameworks to implement in order to be supported in the framework. What this means is that um, the framework itself would work without, without those plugins, but uh, we, have, we have created a um, first plugin based on Ceph that will leverage Rook for its deployment, um, but we give the instructions on how to implement uh, your own caching plugin. And this would be an on-the-fly uh, on deployment of the cache pods without without the user realizing or the user remaining completely oblivious to the fact that um, this data set is uh, provided by a cast uh, from a casting plugin. So also imagine that if you are casting um, data on the local cluster, we can give hints and we're looking in, uh, into this problem about the workload scheduling, to optimize the workload scheduling. So imagine knowing where your data sets are cast in which nodes on the Kubernetes cluster, then it would be pretty straightforward to give hints to the scheduler to bring these pods closer to the cast data. And of course, we're looking to integrate with um, Spark, Kubeflow, and all the uh, ML and deep learning frameworks. Um, so this is the overall uh, approach that we follow. So this is the um, on the one side, there is a user or a dataset provider that creates the dataset CRD, right? So they say, this is my dataset with its name. And then the operator takes care of um, this definition it, and provides the PVCs or the config maps or and the config maps and secrets and so on and so forth. And for the pod to just use this dataset, they just need to do that, right? Like um, add the label, which says dataset dot zero, a number, and then dot ID, the name of the data set they created and how to use it. They could use it as a mount point or they can use it um, by uh, environmental variables. You know, if they're using the S3 API, for instance, they would use the, they would get these um, credentials there and the connection details there. And now the other bit is the, as I said, the caching plugin. So imagine that uh, we can install uh, in parallel, some caching plugins which uh, provide that functionality of caching the datasets, and we have implemented a solution that works on um, uh, for S3 buckets. And in the end, as I said, the co-scheduling of the pods uh, to the to the cast dataset. Um, these are the components and how is how it looks like. So, as an example, flow. So. 
the, the user goes and creates a data set definition, right? So it says, this is my bucket, this is on the cloud IBM or AWS or whatever. This is my bucket and this is the username password for the, for the bucket. Then the data set operator watches the creation of these uh, data sets and creates the necessary PVCs for uh, the corresponding data set. Now, when they go and create their pods, with the labels, we have created an admission controller that basically just says, okay, uh, you have annotated us using a data set. Uh, we're gonna do a lookup and then you will have your pod uh, completely transparently using this data set PVC with only that addition, right? Only with just um, uh, adding a label on the pod. Um, this is now how the um, uh, transparent caching works, right? So I have an, yeah. Yanis, sorry yeah. to interrupt you. If we could go back one slide. Um, the, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a step as in mm -hmm. sort mm -hmm. of, is there, is there um, a data plane or some sort of tool that you're using to create a PVC from, from the S3 bucket? Yeah, so basically the dataset operator, right? We, we it leverages the uh, corresponding uh, CSI plugins. So basically the dataset operator uh, looks for um, datasets, uh, uh, reacts to the creation of dataset objects, right? So uh, this is of type uh, S3, right? So the dataset operator um, realizes that it's an S3 based, so it creates a CSI PVC um, out of uh, S3, right? So it's a dataset operator that creates um, the, let's say the native Kubernetes components uh, um, from, from this dataset. So basically we have, um, it requires to have installed the, as, as part of the framework, we are installing, let's say the CSI S3 and the CSI NFS. So they should be working and do this uh, lifting of creating actually the PVCs, right? The dataset operator is just um, one level above, uh, matching you know the dataset type to the correct storage class of uh, CSI. That, does it make sense? Okay, all right. So yeah, the, the dataset operator is the um, orchestrator, let's say, uh, in this uh, in, in your question, right? So the, this is the core framework, right? So this is our core framework and um, I'm going to show how the transparent caching works, right? So the user goes and declares the data set, right? So within, within the data set operator is the data set controller. So the data set controller makes a check and says, is there any plugin available in the cluster? No. So basically I'm gonna create a shadow uh, object that we call it dataset internal, which has the same credential, same endpoint with the original dataset. And then it goes back to the dataset internal controller, which uh, uh, receives the, this definition and creates the native components, right? So it creates the PVCs, the config maps, the secrets based on the type of uh, the data dataset, right? Now, if there is, sorry, I, I don't know how to move this bit, right? But uh, so in the case that there is a dataset available, uh, the dataset controller delegates the creation of the dataset internal to the plugin. It passes these details and says, you know, you should take care of that, uh, the, the definition of the dataset, but in the end, just give me the dataset internal that I should create. So the, this plugin, so in our case, Ceph, uh, you know, provisions, uh, provisions uh, Ceph via Rook, and it creates a dataset internal at the end, and then it gets handled by the core framework again. So it goes back to the dataset internal controller, and it creates again the corresponding PPCs uh, from the CSI S3 and NFS. So yeah, so we're integrating with various uh, open source projects as well, uh, as I said before. Uh, yeah, the, we have a public uh, GitHub repo for you to have a look. And if you don't have questions, I can give a very short demo to show how this works. So um, please go ahead and uh, tell me if 
uh, we should go with a demo or you have any questions? Yeah. Sorry, Sorry go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my question is that, you know, I, um, I've seen a lot of use cases, but this one's new to me. Mm -hmm. So I think there was some, maybe I would have, for me, uh, maybe for others, it would be nice to see a lot of the whys. Uh, you know, there's a lot of maybe assumption of the why you need that information and that flow. I, I don't, I, I'm not familiar enough with the use case to, to understand mm -hmm. that flow. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe another time, or I don't mm -hmm. know, or maybe just an email, whatever. Uh, it, just a little blurb on, on the why the, the, mm -hmm. the pipeline mm -hmm. works that way. That'd okay. be great. Uh, so um, why... Um, you mean some reasoning a bit on the uh, on the uh, on this flow, or what's the use case in in general? Yeah, what is the user expecting out of this? Like yeah, the, so, you know the, yeah, exactly. the ingestion, okay. the workflow. What is the expectation from the user? I'm not. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. others are, but I I've I've been around for a long time, but I've never seen this type of workflow. So it's new to me. I would love to learn it. So. Uh, okay, so basically the, the use case that we're trying to handle is these cases, right? So when you have uh, users who, so uh, currently in the current landscape, right? So as, as far as we know, right? There is the um, CSI, uh, there is the um, uh, cloud object uh, storage interface that we have seen as a proposal. And it is possible to create um, PVCs out of, um, you know, S3 or NFS or some other type of data sources. But uh, our motivation for the work was that um, if the user just wants to use on their pods some uh, data, data sources without them configuring uh, from the very beginning, you know, installing the plugins, installing the CSI drivers and all this stuff, and they just want to have a pointer to to a data set for them to work, right? This is what we're trying to tackle, right? So uh, a bit higher level of the CSI to give some more abstraction to the end user, right? So, and from the flow of the framework, right? It's, um, so the operator is decay, right? Mo almost all of the, as far as I know, right? Almost all the frameworks based on the operator SDK pattern is that um, they're actually uh, just pods on the on the Kubernetes um, cluster that they are responsible. They are reacting to creation, deletion, and uh, modification of a new custom resource definition that they have introduced, or some native uh, components that already are present on Kubernetes. Right. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is David. Uh, I'm working for European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, mm -hmm. If I may confirm that uh, from user's perspective, this is exactly what we are looking for. Um, a little bit of background that uh, EBI, European Bioinformatics Institute, is a data custodian for all the public, uh, uh, publicly available bioinformatics information. We have about uh, 27 petabytes of data at this point and it doubles every two years. And one of the hurdles for us to move to the clouds, especially public clouds, is that uh, we have big trouble to move the data over to the clouds. And it also does not make sense from economic perspective mm -hmm. to uh, call, dump the data into mm -hmm. either Google or Amazon or whoever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the cost to store a copy of the data in the cloud is really prohibitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we want to yeah. do is have this kind of uh, data pipeline to ingest the data as we, well, depending on what the workload running in the cloud needs. So this is exactly what we are looking for. Thanks, thanks, David. So basically, it's very much on point, right? So um, imagine that um, there is a provider that just gives, you know, disks, right, and a Kubernetes cluster, and there are users who want to use, as David said, remote data sources. But at the same time, um, we want to optimize that by trying to bring as much as closer to the to the pods by caching it, the, the remote. Uh, S3. Now we're mainly working with S3, but uh, you know we have support for NFS as well. 
So trying to load as much of the data in the local disks uh, where the pods are actually running. And this, this is very common on, you know, deep learning workloads that um, they keep on reusing the same data sets, right? So uh, we, we want to completely um, make it transparent for the end users so they don't have to deal with, you know, configuring, optimizing, mounting the data sets. It's uh, all done for them. Right. Hey, so, so, uh, so, 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 Yanis, if, if, if I could just summarize, just to make sure I'm understanding this, because this is mm -hmm. actually pretty interesting. Um, so, so effectively, um, you use the CRs as, as uh, a catalog of data sets. And if, if a data scientist or somebody wants to run a workload in, in, a, in a cluster that's utilizes that data set, then you either sort of orchestrate that the, 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 the file system is available within that cluster, or you implement caching to, to, to make sure it's available in that, in, in that cluster because the data set could be remote, presumably. So this is spot on. So there are both, uh, my answer is both because uh, on one, so we try to tackle two issues, right? One is the um, uh, usability, right? So as you said, a data scientist would go and say, kubectl get data sets on their namespace, and they will see the available ones. So they will just get a name. Uh, imagine that there could be a case where there is another persona creating the data sets for them, right? Uh, we are power users of the framework because we developed it, and we create ourselves the data sets and the pods, right? But uh, in, there is a case that the, act, the actor creating the data sets in the cluster could be different, right? The data provider, and they have the credentials, they have the access, and they know uh, what they want to provide to the end users. And the end users can just uh, label their pods and use that data set mounted inside their pods, right? Without them doing anything. So usability on one side. And now what we added with the caching is that while the framework on its own works and does exactly that thing, right? We uh, bring the hooks for uh, caching frameworks to transparently with minimal uh, effort uh, uh, support caching in this pipeline without the user realizing it's uh, happening at all. So the API, right, for, um, for a caching plugin is that uh, you need, uh, you would be passed a data set and you are responsible for creating a data set internal. So provision, you know, uh, your uh, services, provision your pods, provision whatever you think needs to be provisioned, but in the end gives us, give us the data set internal and all the S3 mounting, all the, the other orchestration stuff happens by us. So imagine the casting plugin won't have to do mounts or uh, implement S3, uh, you know, utilize S3FS on their own it's already part of the core framework. So it tries to tackle both things, right? Uh, and the third step that we want to do now is the scheduling, right? Saying uh, if we know the data sets where are cast in the, in the cluster, maybe we can direct uh, the pod to be scheduled on the, on the node that has the data cast. So to achieve a bit more uh, data locality in that case. That, does that answer your question? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thanks. Sorry, Shane. I think I, I might have interrupted you. Oh, no problem. You can go back to the previous diagram. I just have a, one question. When you create this uh, PVC, is that mm -hmm. a, uh, it's a, it's like an empty PVC? No. You don't have any data source and or it's already populated at this yeah, point? Yeah, yeah. So, the cases that we are handling is, uh, uh, so we support writes, right? Uh, if, you, if you write back on this PVC, it would be synchronized on the cloud, right? We just, um, but the case that we're looking at more is when these data are pre-populated, right? So imagine that you have uh, ImageNet on, uh, on an S3 bucket, right? So when, what the PVC that we create contains this uh, bucket mounted, so it would be, it would reflect the contents of the remote S3 uh, bucket, right? So it's, it's not empty, it's, uh, it has mounted the, uh, 
the contents of the packet, but uh, if within your pod you write stuff to it, it would be synchronized as it, it's, uh, as it is an S3FS mount, right? Uh, so yeah, it, it contains uh, the data there. Uh, so when you provision the PVC, is it dynamically provisioned or is it more exactly. like statically dynamically? Exactly. Exactly. So it's a, it's a dy dynamic PVC, right? And we rely on the CSI S3. Um, so there is, there is a CSI plugin for uh, S3 that we have uh, modified a bit to suit our needs. And yeah, it's a dynamic PVC, right? Yeah. I can, I can actually okay. very, very, very quickly show you that, right? So this is the, an example data set, right? So this is my image net, right? And I do, okay, and if you see, get data sets, you will see that it's there, and data set inter, inter, internal, there you go. So we have this PPC, right? So it was just created, Yanis, 17 seconds ago. And if we, um, create, uh, not this, oh, come on. if we go and use that, right? So we want to use dataset Yanis as mounted. So this is optional, uh, as I showed here. So you can mount it somewhere you want to, or you can uh, leave it to the default. So we create a pod. And if we go inside the pod now, give it a second to start. There you go, it started. So if we go inside the pod, MNT datasets, you will see that it's the dataset that uh, creates the, it has mounted the remote, uh, the remote S3 bucket. So it's the raw data, the bound blocks and the stuff. So th this is the convention that we use. So inside the pod, there would be an MNT uh, data sets, right? Um, so yeah, this is, um, this is how it would look like, right? So uh, as I said, we're looking to optimize the flow of the end user as much as possible, right? So they won't have to deal with, um, you know, uh, they don't have to change the workflow at all. They just need to, uh, the only thing that they need to do from the user's perspective is to uh, annotate their pods like this, right? The two, two labels. Can I see your PVC definition? Uh, my PVC definition, um, PCTA, get PVC, um, describe. Uh, yeah, so basically it's, um, it's using, uh, th this is a dynamic uh, PVC, right? Uh, this okay. is a dynamic PVC, right? So the data set object uh, is like this. So you create this as an end user, you give your credentials, your endpoint, and the bucket, the region, uh, it's, it's just a, this is the new Kubernetes component that we're bringing, right? And then the orchestrator makes sure to create, I think there should be the secrets there. Um, so you see it created a secret with, um, with the credentials. So, so it created the, um, uh, the credentials as a secret, right? And then it was passed to the uh, CSI S3 to, to provide the mounted endpoint, the, to provide the mount point. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we actually, we have a Kubernetes cozy sub project in Kubernetes six storage now. I think there are a lot of similarities here. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely should uh, talk about and see how to collaborate here. Okay, so uh, I will be. Uh, I think I'm scheduled for next week on the Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, starters. we have. Yeah, yeah we uh, canceled sorry. the last last yeah, yeah. week's meeting because of yeah. the holidays. Yeah. Yeah. So we are looking to 
we're looking to apply for uh, sandbox as well on the CNCF. And uh, as far as I know, there is a pull request that we need to make, right? Alex, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, right? I, I don't remember a form. I remember, I remember a pull request that we need to have with a template, right? Uh, no, so, so the sandbox project app application process has has changed recently so so now it's it's just um an form. online form that you, ah, that, that you need to fill okay. in okay okay so i need to look at the uh, chat that you sent um yeah okay. I, I'm, i've just reposted the the link to the form okay. In, the, okay. in the chat window mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah okay uh, that's it from me i'm uh, Please reach out if you have any more questions or use case that you want to discuss. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's our project. Uh, yeah, thanks for for listening. Um, th thanks, thanks, Yanis. Um, that that thanks. was uh, that was a really interesting uh, presentation. Some some new use cases and well done for doing a live demo. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Okay then. Does does anybody have uh, anything else to add, or any other agenda items they'd like to cover? Uh, Alex, I was just curious whether uh, anyone has anything planned for either of the upcoming KubeCons for, for the SIG. Um, we have uh, uh, we have uh, an intro session. Um, scheduled for the KubeCon EU and, and we've just been, we've just gotten confirmation of um, a slot that, that we got for the um, China session as well. Um, so yeah, uh, um, Aaron and I are, are trying to book the slots to sort of pre-record that, uh, that session. Awesome, oh, so, so they're both, uh, they're, they're not live. Um, I think I need to read up on it. I th the the way it seems to be working is that we're pre-recording the, the the sessions, um, and then there will be sort of live Q and A. But okay. uh, yeah, the sessions are being. I think for the China uh, virtual meeting, you're not required to be there, but everything is pre-recorded. Um, but for the European one, I think you are required to be there for the Q&A as well. Yeah, I guess the timing for the, the China time is is probably tricky. Yeah, uh, even the European one, I think it's the time is also like European time, not uh, US time. Yeah, makes sense. Anyway, well, uh, let us know, Alex, if you need a hand preparing any of the material or doing anything else, uh, uh, let us know. Um, Will do. Yeah, we're. I'll. I'll. I'll share. I'll share the the deck um, for comments on the on the SIG mailing list. That's a good idea. Cool. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's, it's we've come up to time. So thanks. Thanks, everyone, for all the presentations, and um, look forward to meeting you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.